Uh, say, uh, and now for something <laughs> completely different. I'm uh, very uh, glad to be here uh, at this uh, workshop and to talk about uh, some approaches that, in my view, relate information and coordination in a very concrete way. But it's information in a slightly different sense than what you're used to, and I believe that connections exist and should and can be uh, further developed and exploited as we go along. So the title of the, this talk, my first talk, is Knowledge and uh, Coordinated Action. And essentially in distributed computing we have a large variety of uh, models. Um, we can have, we can communicate by sending messages or by using uh, shared memory or by signaling in various ways. Uh, the topology, we could be using uh, different uh, topologies for our system. They could be fixed, they could be changing over time. We can have uh, different models for timing, whether nodes do or don't have clocks. Um, what guarantees there exist on how long communication takes, and many such issues, synchrony, asynchrony, partial synchrony, all these are uh, vary greatly from one system to another. And similarly, in terms of computing power, we can have data centers, servers, mobile devices, sensor networks. All of these are called distributed systems. And because, partly because of the huge variety, we have uh, no single Turing machine uh, abstraction, and uh, we have very uh, few, practically, uh, no general results for all distributed systems. So I'm going to talk today about an approach that generates, that, <coughs> that allows for some of these, and uh, the basic point that I'm going to get across is that a notion of knowledge is really an essential aspect of distributed computing. So when we design protocols for, say, doing electronic mail or solving some problem over the internet, we talk a lot about knowledge, what one knows, knows about another, where when we get an acknowledgement, we know that something happens somewhere, so now we can change our uh, communication or rely on some other site being ready for something. And uh, you know, the notion, the study of knowledge goes back for thousands of years. Philosophers uh, in uh, China and uh, Greece and whatever have studied it. There's a long tradition. Uh, and I'm going to try to, and so the logics of uh, epistemic logic and whatever, I'm going to touch on these. But I want to show you in a very concrete way why uh, knowledge is really essential in distributed computing. So I'm going to look at a very simple problem that I call computing the maximum. And uh, in this case, we have a network. And every node starts out with some initial value. And we want to compute the value that is the largest. Compute the maximum. And by computing the maximum, I want to be very concrete. I want process or agent one, in this case, uh, Alice, the green figure on the left, to print. She has this printer on the side. She's going to print one value. This value has to be the maximum. So computing the maximum is not some uh, abstract notion. There's this action I want to happen. OK? So in this particular scenario, suppose that uh, <coughs> Beverly, number two, sends number one a message saying, my value is 100. OK? So now Alice has the maximal value. You see 100 is the maximal value. And the question is, can she now print it? And generally, I haven't given all you know, I haven't described the situation very generally, but typically we would say no. 
if we assume that every uh, process only has initially access to its own value, then receiving the maximal value is not enough in order to print it. Because Alice doesn't know what other values may be in the system, even though all the other values are smaller, and 100 is the maximum. There's another scenario that uh, Alice can consider possible, in which uh, process 3 has a larger value. Okay? So even though she received the maximum here, she can't print it because she doesn't know that it's the maximum. She thinks maybe there's a larger value. Okay? So one can say, fine, uh, you know, not, have, not seeing all the values, uh, we can't expect Alice to print the maximum. But in fact, you don't really need to collect all the values. For example, we could have a protocol, a strategy, by which uh, messages, if we assume that the, the network is a, is a tree, or in this case, an instance of a tree, and uh, we collect values bottom-up from the leaves to the root, which is our process one that's supposed to print, and at each point, every uh, process receiving a message from, or messages from the children will compare its own value to the maximal received and pass on only the maximum, then in this case, when Alice receives the same message, value 2 is 100, but generated through this uh, protocol, she can compare 100 to her own value, see that it's largest, and print it. So we don't need to collect all values in order to uh, compute the maximum. Now, in fact, collecting all the values is not necessarily sufficient. Even if you have all the values, it's not always the case that you can print the maximum. And why? Well, I may be, uh, you, you may feel this is slightly cheating, but essentially the question is, what information does Alice have about the graph to begin with? If she doesn't know what the graph is, but it's only, only that it's a spanning tree, or suppose that Alice knows that there could be either four or five nodes in the graph. She receives all four values, so in particular she has all values. She can't print the maximum unless she is guaranteed that a fifth value is not out there, because the fifth value might actually, if it's there, might be bigger. Okay? So, what we see here is that collecting all values is not sufficient because, again, Alice doesn't know when she has all the values in her hand. Okay? So, the question is, what is computing the maximum about if it's not about collecting the values? And I claim that it's about, the, the problem itself is about obtaining knowledge that you have that a particular value is the maximum. If you, you could receive 100, but you can't print it, you might receive all the values, about whatever, you might, uh, <coughs> in some other cases, obtain this knowledge in different ways. But the point is that computing the maximum is about, the, the, the essential problem is, reaching a state in which there's a value, and I know that this value is largest. Okay? So, in fact, knowing that the maximum is C is the necessary condition for printing C in the definition of the problem. And knowing this is actually, turns out to be necessary. And, well, if you know that the maximum is C, then assuming that the notion of knowledge we talk about is constructive, then it's necessary and sufficient. I mean, you can't print a value unless you know it's the maximum. If you think there might be a bigger one, you can't print it. And once you do know it's the maximum, you can print it. Okay? So, any questions? I mean, I'm going to define the notion of knowledge soon, which is consistent to this scenario, but any questions about this 
example so far? What? No, no, it's clear. On okay, the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not. So, knowing, how, how do we know this? Well, we can, uh, this knowledge can depend on lots of things. It can depend on the signals I received, the messages I collected. It can depend on the protocol. So, under one protocol, say, uh, bottom up, uh, what we call converge cast, uh, you can get just this one message. So, the protocol matters. What uh, domain of initial values? we assume matters, because if the values are just percentiles, I see 100, I don't care if there are a million values, I, I know it's the, the, the maximum. It depends on the network topology and what's known about it. It depends on what timing guarantees there are, how long I know, I mean, when do I know that I've heard from everyone? That depends on what we know about time and timing. It can depend on failures and on many other things. So, the question of when this knowledge happens is, can be subtle, but knowledge that maximum equals C is really the essence of a problem like computing the maximum, which is a, a standard problem in distributed computing. The leader election, for example, is done exactly in this way. Now, <coughs> this, uh, this need, or this is essential role of knowledge is not just uh, relevant to this particular case. In fact, it's an instance of a very general principle. And this principle, uh, informally, I write in this way, it says that if some condition phi has to be true when process I, player I, performs an action, a particular action A, or alpha here, then I must know phi is a, has to be true when performing alpha. So if, if, if phi is necessary condition for performing alpha, then knowing phi is also a necessary condition for performing alpha. We saw computing the maximum was just a particular instance of this, and this can be formulated as a theorem. It took me 30 years to formulate it, and uh, it will take uh, three lines if we go really long and slow to prove it, but such is life. Now this, this really applies very broadly. So for example, suppose we look at a bank system and we have ATMs, and we have a necessary condition for the ATM giving me 100 euros is that I have enough credit in enough, you know, high enough balance in my bank. Then, uh, in fact, for the ATM to pay me, it should know that I have enough credit. Because otherwise, I mean, if it pays me without knowing I have credit, on another day, I will come, and without credit, in the same kind of scenario, I'm going to get the money. If, uh, for example, a very classical problem in distributed computing is called mutual exclusion, where there's some critical section, uh, where, like a printer, where only one user is allowed to be using this critical section at any given time, or an intersection, or there are many uh, examples of this. So, uh, in order to enter the critical section, it must be the case that no one else is there. So, if that's a necessary condition for entering the critical section, then knowing that nobody is in the critical section becomes necessary. And uh, an example from life sciences. You know uh, how jellyfish operates. You know, jellyfish uh, sting us when we go into the ocean or into the sea. They have on... Uh, their <coughs> ligaments, they have these very tiny cells, and each cell has a, uh, an arrow, which is strung, which is sort of tightly packed uh, as a spring, and when it touches your skin, it fires this arrow at, I think, 10,000 G, about four times uh, you know, a bullet, into our skin. So that's how it operates. But it doesn't sting itself. It doesn't sting a rock. 
And so if uh, it's built, if jellyfish are built so that in order to sting, it has to be the case that what I'm stinging is not a, uh, not my own, not my other leg, then uh, I have to know that it's not my other leg. Now, who has to know this here? It's the agent performing the action, which is actually the cell. It's not, you know, it's not the, the jellyfish that thinks that, oh, here's your arm, great, let's uh, sting it. It's, the, the decision is made at the cell, and the cell needs to have some kind of friend or foe um, mechanism to do this. Okay, we can extend to others. Suppose uh, my mother tells me never to jump head first into the swimming pool if there's no water, then I actually have to know that there's no water when I do that, or if I, a, ju a judge is only allowed to send me to prison if I actually committed the crime for which I'm being awarded this uh, punishment, then uh, I should uh, know this. Okay, so I call this the knowledge of preconditions, knowledge of preconditions principle, and one implication is that even though when we're described, when problems are described to us, they don't, they're typically not formulated in terms of knowledge, every specification implies lots of knowledge conditions. All the all the conditions between actions and the world, actions and other actions or whatever, actually induce uh, knowledge preconditions. And we're going to see an application of this uh, later on. This, as I said, is a, is a theorem which applies very broadly in distributed multi-agent systems and it's part of a theory of knowledge in distributed systems that uh, started in the 80s, and there's a book by Fagan and uh, others on reasoning about knowledge, which is the basic book in the field, and I'm going to give you a crash course on, on this. The, the book is 500 pages, and uh, hopefully Sasha will allow me. So, how do we define knowledge in uh, distributed systems? We, or how do we think about a protocol or a system? Well, we identify it with a set of possible histories, a set of possible infinite executions. Okay, these are these. Each one of these is an infinite execution, which is a global state, an initial global state, followed by another one, followed by yet another one, and so on. Okay, that's, that's what a computation looks like. And here, because it's distributed, then it, at each global state, every one of the players has its own local state. So that's why you have different, pick, different uh, colors within each circle here. So a global state is a snapshot of the whole system. And uh, a run is just an infinite sequence of global states, and the system, as I said, is identified with a set of, of these uh, runs. So whenever, say, you have some, uh, some program you can consider, or a set of strategies, you can consider all histories that they generate, and that gives you the system that you want to study when you're looking at this program or this pro <coughs> solution. Now, um, within a, the, the sequence of global states in Iran, we actually call points, where at every point, a point is a pair R comma T, referring to time T in the run R. So it's the Tth uh, global state within the run R. And uh, we we, we're going to talk about what is true or false at different points in the system. Okay, so at the point in the system, it could be true that x equals zero. It could be true that, uh, <coughs> that say, uh, I received five messages from you, or whatever we want to talk about. The maximal value could be 100. Uh, and one can define a logic uh, to do this. I'm not going to... Uh, focus on the, the standard parts of the logic, but the logic is going to have knowledge operators, so Ki phi will mean 
agent I or player I knows phi, where phi is any formula that we inductively uh, constructed, and um, and I'm only going to focus on uh, the clause for uh, when knowledge is true. So. A basic assumption in this is going to be that within a global state, each one of the uh, participants has a well-defined local state. Your local state is the information you have when you perform an action. It uh, will be typically the state of your memory, where you are in the program, but basically it's the information on which decisions are made. And uh, we're going to talk about facts as being true at time t in some run r within a system r. And we're going to, the definition is going to be that agent i knows some fact, say the maximum is uh, 100 or something like that, if at all points of the system at which this agent has the same information, the same local state, this is true. Okay, so uh, KIPC holds at time t in run R within this, with respect to the system if PC is true at all other points RT in which <coughs> I has the same local state as it does at RT. But time t may be different. What? T and T prime are two times and uh, in a system in which there's a global clock, they will have to be the same because you, you know, because your local state tells you the time. But in general, they can be different. You have different executions. So you have a program. It has uh, different inputs in different instances. The adversary behaves differently. So you have different executions. You, you have a protocol. Think of a, say, a cryptographic protocol. You have lots of executions. So you look at all possible executions. That's, that will be the, the system that we reason about. You can add probability, although there's no, in my talks today, there will be no explicit probability in the game. OK? So it's just the set of all executions of your protocol. So informally, the, the set of possible runs is known to all the agents. Yeah, well, this whole analysis is from the point of view of the protocol designer, which is you sitting and, and designing a program that will be put in, and so the answer is yes, but, uh, but the analysis is done from us playing God and looking at the system and saying, oh, this cell knew that uh, this was uh, not another jellyfish, even though you know, it doesn't, we can't talk to it, we can't ask it about jellyfish, we don't, but we can still, so it's, it's an external observer's uh, view, but yes, the, the system is given. And in fact, that's a crucial aspect of the story. So, the same definition in pictures. Suppose what we have here is we have some, uh, some point that we're talking about. And suppose these are all points at which player I has the same local state as at the, the original point. Now, suppose that phi is true at this point, And it's also true at all of the points where it has the same local state, then it knows phi. Okay, so if phi is true at all points at which I have the same information, then I know phi. That's the definition here. This is an instance of what's called in modal logic possible world semantics, Kripke semantics, but th this is the definition. Okay, if phi is true at all points at which I have the same information as I have now, I know phi. That's the definition. If uh, there is some point, you know, equivalently, if there's some point that I consider possible, that, that means I have the same information there as I have here, so I can't tell them apart, then uh, at which phi is false, then I don't know phi. Okay? If we have this, this, then I don't know. That's, that's the definition. So what's important is that 
my information is identified with my local state. Okay, we have to, when we model things, the local state should capture the information available to you when you perform decisions. And uh, KIPC, I know PC, exactly if C is guaranteed to be true, given my local state and the system. Okay? And so this notion of knowledge is completely independent of any notion of uh, computation, of complexity. I mean, I know, of course, all theorems of mathematics, because they're always true at all points I consider possible, and, and so on. Okay? But this is interesting because I'm interested at questions that are not necessarily theorems of mathematics, but they, they result from some spontaneous events, like what initial values were, or who received the message, who failed, and, and so on and so forth. Okay? So in this sense, it's a, I call it an information-based notion of, of knowledge because... So in this uh, here, we don't know, uh, in, in the original scenario, uh, Alice knows that, uh, doesn't know that the maximum is 100, but she sees 100, she knows it's at least 100, and then so on and so forth. Okay, so now let's uh, go, I want to prove, see I'm <coughs> uh, it may take a bit. So I want to prove, first of all, knowledge of preconditions, the knowledge of preconditions principle. So I'm going to say that a necessary condition for performing an action, so does I alpha will be true at uh, some point if I is performing alpha there. Okay, between this point, RT and RT plus one, alpha happens. So C is a necessary condition for performing alpha in the system, if whenever <coughs> alpha is performed, C is true. Okay, so my protocol satisfies this necessary condition if it never performs alpha, if C is not true. So that's what a necessary condition means. And all of the examples we had uh, before, dispensing cash is a necessary condition for having good credit and all these things, okay. Now, uh, I'm not going to define protocols uh, in great uh, detail, so instead I'm going to say that an action is a conscious action for an agent if, <coughs> if I perform it at some point RT. And there's another point at which I have the same local state, uh, R prime, T prime, then I'm also going to perform it at R prime, T prime. So my local state determines whether or not I perform the action. If that's the case, I call it a conscious action for I. Okay? So now, the knowledge of preconditions theorem says, if alpha is a conscious action for I, and phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha, for I performing alpha, then knowing phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha. Okay, this is exactly, this is just the formal version of my intuition. So here is the proof. Is it, is it every action a conscious no. So it depends on whether your protocol is deterministic or not, and, and so it's not, but uh, typically in many cases if you think of Definitely in synchronous systems, deterministic protocols, all actions are conscious, okay? But neither is, is in, true in general, but okay. But it's very broad. So, for example, okay, so here's the proof. Suppose that alpha is conscious for I and phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha. And suppose that I performs alpha at this point, and these are the other points that it considers possible then because this action is a conscious action, it will perform the action at all the points at which it has the same local state. Now because phi is a necessary condition for performing these actions, phi is going to be true at all of these points where I perform alpha. And so by definition of knowledge, ki phi has to be true. So whenever I perform alpha, performs alpha, I must know phi. End of proof. 30 years. Some, 
slow. OK, so now I'm going to go through uh, an application. OK? Uh, any questions at this point? OK, it's all, it's all clear, but I think, I mean, everything I've said so far should be very simple, but not very common to most of you. So it would be good if uh, questions are right. OK, so I'm going to look at a very classical problem, a classic problem in, in a classical problem in distributed computing called consensus. The model is going to be a, f a complete graph, synchronous, so time goes uh, in rounds, messages sent in a round are received in the same round, and um, the essence is a problem of reaching agreement. Every one of the processes, we have n processes, each one of them starts with some initial value, either 0 or 1, and they need to agree on the value. Uh, they have full knowledge of the global clock, and uh, they follow what's, uh, for this example, they're going to follow the full information protocol, which means in every round, each process sends all the others, all the information it has. Okay, so it's complete history. I'm going to give the definition in, in, uh, in a second. I'm but uh, just the model. So the model is full information protocol means I start out, I send my message to everyone, and the next round I send my, my current information to everyone, and so on. But we're going to look at a model in which we can have crash failures. And that means that at some point I might crash. When I do, I try to send to everyone, but I'm actually going to succeed in sending to some. That's the black arrows are successful messages, and for some arbitrary subset, I'm going to fail. So Sasha will receive my message, and Peter maybe not, and then Maya maybe yes, and then so on. Okay? That's what happens in the crash failure model, and we're going to assume that there's some bound of uh, some t, a fixed bound that's given to the protocol designer on how many failures uh, may happen in any given round. So I want a program that will be correct as long as no more than t processes fail. So what is correct? I want three conditions. I want every, so first of all, a process that never crashes is called correct. Okay, and if it, otherwise it's faulty. So I want every correct process to eventually decide on a value, either zero or one. I want the decision, <coughs> you can only decide on a value if one of the initial values was that value. So you can only decide zero if it's not the case that everyone decided one, and you can only decide one if you know, it's not the case that everyone decided zero. That's called validity, and agreement says all correct processes, all the ones that never crash, are going to have to decide on the same value. Okay? That's right. Yeah, this is the process that crashed. It but crashed in, in, in the fourth round. But, but in different rounds, there are different processes that crash. Yes, at most t, there's a bound of at most t, processes can crash. At, at even any given round. In any given uh, history. Mm -hmm. In any given history. And in, 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 in a particular round, any number, as long as the sum is no more than t. Okay? So, the, the total number of process, so if a process crashes, uh, the, that, uh, at, at one point, once a process crashes, it remain, uh, remains crashed? Yes. Uh, once it crashes, then, the then it, it, it's dead and it never sends anything. Oh. So here, I, I'm fine, I'm sick, and then <laughs> nobody hears from me anymore. My sick round, my crashing round is the one in which you might not hear from me, someone else will, and that's, so this, this causes confusion. But they are not, not sending false messages. Not any? Not sending no false messages. We all I follow the protocol, but... Okay, good. So, uh, well, there's a well-defined the lower bounds saying that any protocol that solves this problem has to run for t plus one rounds in the worst case. So we'll have at least one execution that goes for t plus one rounds, and now, I want to do a knowledge-based analysis of consensus using knowledge of preconditions to see, let's see how long I go. So 
Validity said, I'm not allowed to decide zero unless someone started with zero. So someone started with zero is a necessary condition for deciding zero. Okay? So by the knowledge of preconditions, knowing that someone started with zero is a necessary condition for deciding zero. And similarly for one. Right? Okay. So now, uh, well, when do I know that there's a zero? Well, uh, I mean, the definitions are fancy, but essentially I know there's a zero if either I'm born with a zero or I receive a message that shows me there's a zero. So uh, this is not, we don't need all these definitions for when do you know there's a zero. You saw a zero, you know there's a zero. Okay? Now I want to uh, ask, well, how can it be that at some time m, uh, m is 17 or whatever, uh, you know there's a zero and I don't know there's a zero. Okay, that's the, these two nodes here. <coughs> How can that be? Well, it's the full information protocol. If you know there's a zero, well, we're both, and we're both alive, right? We haven't crashed. Yesterday, you were alive, you sent me a message, and I still don't know there's a zero, right? So that means, and I received your message. So now the full information protocol, you sent me a message, I received your message, I don't know there's a zero, that means yesterday you didn't know there's a zero, right? But now you do know there's a zero. So how can that be? Well, you received a message with a zero from someone who didn't know there's a zero, right? I don't know there's a zero. I heard, I hear from you yesterday. You are J in this picture and I'm I. Yes? But maybe I knew, so if I knew it was a zero, I sent a zero to you, does it mean that then you then, then I would know, because you send me your whole history. Uh, you, everything, your, your whole information I get. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, full information. Nobody sends false messages. No false messages, nothing. That's just yeah. everything. Okay? So you didn't know there's a zero yesterday, but you do know now. So someone sent you a message yesterday that got to you now with a zero. But I still don't know there's a zero. So this uh, other process, J prime, crashed before sending to me. This was the crashing round. It sent you a zero, but I didn't get a zero from it, so it had to crash. So for this to happen, there must be a crash in the last round. Okay? But what happened yesterday? Well, J prime knew about the zero, and I didn't know. So there must have been, you know, there must have been, if we zoom out, there must have been someone else who crashed, you know, sent J prime, but crashed before sending to me, or sending to you, you also didn't know zero, and we can go all the way back. So what we get here, is that if at time m, time 17, you know there's a zero and I don't know there's a zero, 17 casualties had to happen. One, the one who was born with a zero, and then the one from time one and from time two, okay? So one thing this tells us is that uh, at time t plus one, either, well, we can't have this situation at t time t plus one, because if at time t plus one, you know of a zero and I don't, there were t plus one failures. But the adversary, I mean, nature is not allowed to kill t plus one, only at most t. Or my pro, my, actually, my solution should not work if it uh, failed more than t, so, okay? So, a very simple protocol for consensus is just, and this is a very well-known uh, protocol for consensus, it says, go, for t plus one rounds, full information. Now, if you know a zero, if you know there's a zero, decide zero. If you don't know there's a zero, decide one. Okay? Then we're guaranteed that time t plus one, either everyone alive knows about the zero, or nobody does, because we can't have this inconsistency. Okay? Very simple. Everyone decides in time t plus one, at time t, so this is uh, optimal in, in the worst case sense. Fine. T is given, yes. 
consensus. We have the bound is given a priori, and I, the protocol designer, should provide a solution which uh, works as long as no more than t fails. So if more than t fails, I mean, that can happen in life, but my contract gets me off the hook. Okay? So fine. In this case, well, uh, if we look at this carefully, well, we see that in some cases I know what I'm going to decide even before time t plus 1. Right? In particular, if I see a 0, then I know that if I'm going to be alive at t plus 1, I'm going to decide 0. I don't forget. I saw a 0 already. So we can improve the protocol to be faster by saying if you see a 0, if you know there's a 0, decide 0. And otherwise, at time t plus 1, if you still don't know there's a 0, decide 1. OK? And remember, the previous protocol was we go until time t plus 1. It, uh, then, if I know there's a 0, I decide 0. And otherwise, I decide 1. And it's OK if somebody decides 0 and then fails. Yeah. Because the, the condition is all the good guys have to decide the same value. So if, yeah, if someone decides 0, fails, and then everyone else decides 1, that's fine. The, the agreement was all correct processes decide the same value. OK? Why is it optimal? Well, I mean, there was a lower bound of t plus 1 rounds. What? No, no, I mean, no. this, all decisions are time t plus 1. Yeah. Dolev Strong says every protocol has to have a, a run that takes t plus 1 rounds. So in that sense, it's, it, it matches the lower yeah, bound. The lower bound is not true? No, no, that's not. I'm not going to go into it, but it's not trivial. OK? So this is also optimal, but it's better than the other optimal one. Because in, some, in many cases, we decide early. If uh, some good guy wakes up with a zero, everyone is going to decide zero you know, at, at time one. Right? So the, that was optimal. This is optimal, but it's better than the other one. And it's better in the sense, well, I'm not, I, I guess I don't want to. It's better in the sense that it dominates the previous one. In all executions, the second protocol will decide as soon as the first one, and in some cases, sooner. OK, for all behaviors of the, the adversary, we have this. OK, I'm not going to go into this because I want to take the second applications of knowledge of preconditions. Second application says, fine, suppose that we've decided, well, decide, decision on 0 in these protocols was as fast as possible. Because you can't decide 0 before you know that someone had a 0. And here, you do it at the first point at which. So you, you can't improve decisions on 0 in these protocols. How about? Decisions on one. So suppose that as a protocol decider, a designer, I decided that decisions on zero will be anyone who sees a zero decides zero. Now, how fast can I decide one? Well, the agreement condition says that <coughs> I'm not allowed to decide one if any uh, correct uh, process decides zero. So, in particular, if any Active, if anyone who's currently alive decides zero, I can't decide one because this process might uh, survive. It doesn't have to crash. So, in fact, <coughs> a necessary condition for deciding one is that nobody who is currently alive knows of a zero. Because if someone who's currently allowed alive, knows of a zero, they decide zero, and they might uh, live. And if I decide one, I might also live, you know. And if this disaster happens, then we violate. OK? So by knowledge of preconditions, I have to know. Knowing that nobody knows of a zero is a necessary condition for deciding one. Right? That's just straight knowledge of preconditions. So here's an optimal protocol for consensus. If you know there's a zero, decide zero. And if you know that nobody knows there's a zero, decide one. So this, you can't decide zero any faster. 
and you can't decide one any faster if this is your rule for deciding zero. Now, so... But you say nobody knows you, it's referred to the same moment. Right now. Uh, That's right. So f facts are true at one point yeah. and not true at another point. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's right now. I have to know that nobody who's currently alive you know, knows zero. So how can I... How can I do this? Well, I mean, right, so this is a protocol, but it's uh, written in my funny language with knowledge. It's not C++, or you, know, you can't put it to the compiler. So what do we do? So we want to convert this into a standard protocol. And, well, we, we go to the literature. And we, we find someone who will tell us, right? So Sherlock Holmes, you know, his business is to know what other people don't know. So we, well, uh, he doesn't actually solve this problem, but I think he gives us insp inspiration. We also want to know what other people don't know. So how do we do this? Well, we want to test when, so we, we, we know, when do you know there's a zero if you've seen a zero? When do you know that nobody knows there's a zero? Well, for that, let's go back to our analysis of when do I know, when can it be, that uh, somebody knows of a zero and I don't. Okay, they, as usual, told everybody but didn't tell me. So this was our picture, right? And um, in this case, uh, you knew there's a zero and I didn't know there's a zero. So obviously, in this case, I don't know that nobody knows there's a zero because, in particular, you know there's a zero, right? So it doesn't hold here. But I don't see this. Of course, I don't see that there was someone who started with a zero. If I did see that, then I would know there's a zero. And that it's sent to someone. So what do I see? In fact, I see blanks. I mean, for some nodes, so for some processes that sometimes I know the information. I see the information. Now these are the blue nodes here, are nodes where I see the information. There are other nodes for which I have proof that this process was crashed at this time because someone else already didn't hear from it the, the round before. And all these guys in this, uh, what I call, hidden path from the zero to you are, from my view, I just don't know what happened there. Okay, there are hidden nodes as far as I'm concerned because I, I don't know that they crashed. In fact, they didn't, in our example. And I don't know what information they had. I mean, I don't see. Yeah, yeah, but when I say, uh, so actually uh, this process at time, uh, 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 I, at time I, so it doesn't have just this one badge where I know who sent it, but, but those also, uh, when, when somebody sends a message, they also send information about who, who who crashed? They received and what yes, so yes, of course. They send all, sorry, all the records of what was sent to them. Yes. Because that no, no, I mean, in, in a sense, your local state in this world is just a subgraph of, of the past. Or, or a subgraph of, or, or, it's just a subgraph of all the past. But, uh, so well, it's a cone of a subgraph going, going backward, right? Oh, okay. Some, in, in this subgraph, I have some nodes that I see. They contain proof about some nodes that are crashed, and there are some nodes on which I don't have information. And it's only possible that you know of a zero and I don't if, if there is such a hidden path. There's someone at time zero, I don't know what they had, and there was someone at time one, which may have heard from them, but I don't see what they had, and there's someone at time two that may have heard from the one at time one. So we have to have this picture of this, uh, this path here. Hidden path. Okay, I call this the hidden path. So, from my point of view, I'm process I, every node is either blue, it's, I see it, or it's crashed, so I have a proof that it, no information came out of there, or it's hidden, because it's neither this nor that. Okay? So, I'm going to say, I'm going to take probably three, four minutes, but we're going to get to a, a conclusion, okay, Sasha? 
Good. So I'm going to say that a time k is revealed. So this is a time k. All the nodes at time k. Time k is revealed if for all nodes at this time k, either I see the node or I have proof that it was crashed. Okay? If there is some time k that is revealed to me at time m, so this is with respect to, to this guy looking, right? The, the information that I have at time m, time 17. So if there's some time before that is revealed, then I claim there can't be a hidden path, because a hidden path would have to have a hidden node at each previous time, including time k. Okay? And conversely, if no time k is revealed to me, then there's one node at time zero that I don't see and I don't know what they had. There's one node at time one that I don't see, but I don't know that they crashed. So there is, in fact, a hidden path if no time is revealed to me right now. And if there's a hidden path, then, of course, in my paranoia, for sure it started with a zero and sent you a zero and sent her a zero and him a zero and, and you know, Peter knows of a zero and I don't and nobody told me, right? So, in fact, <coughs> some time is revealed. So, some time is revealed to me if and only if I know that nobody knows. There's a, I mean, if, if there's a time that's revealed and there's no zero at that time, then I know that nobody currently knows of a zero. Okay? So, um, that's a characterization. This is Sherlock helping us to know what other people don't know. And, uh, I mean, this is just a depiction of the, any hidden path would, would be blocked by this uh, revealed time. And so, in fact, our optimal protocol now reduces to, if you've seen a zero, decide zero. And if some time k is revealed to you and you don't know there's a zero, that's an else here, so if, <coughs> then you decide one. So this is actually the implementation of this knowledge-based protocol that we had before. And this actually dominates the, the previous uh, solution, but it's more than that. It's unbeatable in the sense that no protocol dominates this, because you know, it does zero as fast as possible and one as fast as possible as it does zero. The proof is a little more uh, involved. And we can implement this, in fact, by looking at what we need, what information we need to, care, to look at in order to calculate these things, then we can implement this not with full information, but with messages that on average have size log n. And so it becomes, you know, comes from this terrible exponential protocol to something very practical. Does this protocol dominate all other consensus protocols? Or no, there is no protocol that dominates all other consensus protocols because, uh, well, the protocol P2 uh, or its symmetric protocol for that once that goes to one as soon as possible when you know one when you know there's a one you decide one so for any adversary one of them decides after one round so something that would dominate everything would have to always decide after one round but the lower bound is t plus one for worst case so I don't think so, but... Uh, so you mean that this protocol... Where is the two I protocols, but, but, uh, but are max, there's only two protocols that are max, then it's only this? Um, whether this and it's symmetric, if, if then possibly this and it's symmetric might, might uh, dominate. So for any protocol and any execution, one of these would probably beat it. I think so, because you have to decide when there's a zero. I mean, if you decide zero, then uh, you can't decide earlier than this guy, 
And if you decide one, you can't decide earlier than that guy. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's true quite simply. Okay, so what we've seen here is this notion of knowledge of preconditions, which is, uh, seems very straightforward and the proof is trivial, but we can get some fairly non-trivial results using it. I mean, this is better than all protocols that existed for 35 years. This is a joint paper with Armando Castaneda and Yanai Goncharovsky, published uh, in 2014. And the problem was around since uh, 78. So, uh, that's a difficult part of implementation, I guess, also. No, no, this. How, how to implement using only so, so few messages? Uh, it's not, uh, not, I mean, you, you only pass zeros when uh, you see a zero, and you pass information about failures. So, if you see I failed, you, you tell everyone you're on failed. And if you discover that, in fact, I failed one round before that, then you also send that information. And if you have nothing to say in a given round, you send a, a ping saying, I'm alive. And you can do, so that, that's the, the basis for the implementation. And so, I mean, there's nothing, I mean, you have to do the details, but there's nothing difficult. The point of, I mean, this, is, this looks like, Trivial and obvious once we have these notions, but these notions were not around. So after lunch, I'm going to uh, use knowledge of preconditions to analyze uh, information about time and coordination in a more direct way. So it's going to be a different application of the same notions.